Good morning. How do I do that thingy with the moving on the pictures thing? Here. Ah, marvellous, thank you. Well, um, George W. Bush, who's not somebody I generally start my talks by quoting, <laughs> once uh, addressed a, a meeting of bankers by saying, some people call you the elite, I call you my base. Well, you're my base, so it's fantastic to be here, back here with everybody. Um, uh, picking up on what Jeff said, I did my permaculture design course in 1992 and it rewired my brain. And uh, since then, uh, that's really been the lens through which I've seen the world. And uh, after that, I did, I did as, as Andy said, I used to do perma courses, uh, cartoons for the permaculture magazine. This was one of my favourite that I found the other day. Um, those of you who, who, who do dry lands permaculture uh, have, need to understand the sort of a gelatinous a tide that engulfs us temperate permaculturists in this country in terms of slugs, a, a rich vein of humour. So uh, I, uh, I did my diploma in, in 96. I taught permaculture, set up the first two-year permaculture design course in the world uh, in Ireland in Kinsale College and uh, had a great time and uh, did lots of that kind of stuff. And then in 2004, uh, David Holmgren's book came out and uh, rewired my brain again. Because it said, basically, we need to scale this stuff up really, really fast. And so really, since then, my kind of driving question has really been, how do we scale this stuff up? How do we take those design principles that are so awesome and fantastic, and that, as Jeff said, are the, are the foundation of a, of a sustainable uh, world, a beautiful, abundant, nourishing world, how do we scale that stuff up? And so for me, transition was really based around the idea of, of a Trojan horse, in effect. I read this and I was like, right, come on then, let's sort this out. And looking around then in 2004 at the permaculture of people around me at the time, people often seemed quite happy in a kind of a niche, in a kind of a community, as you said, Kathy, where people were kind of talking the same language and, uh, uh, and, and it didn't feel we needed some way of scaling this up. I thought, what would it look like if we could have a Trojan horse that we could put permaculture principles in? I was wondering what that guy's thinking, looking out the horse, they're thinking, what, me? On my own? I thought other people were coming up in here with me too. Um, <laughs> But actually, how do we put those principles in there, other stuff as well, so that it can just be wheeled past everybody without needing to get the flip chart out and draw the arrows and the greenhouses and the chickens. They could just go, oh, it's transition, and in it goes. And that was really what informed it. So for me, I did my permaculture diploma presentation in 1996. So today, uh, having sort of been away, or not so involved in, in, in permaculture for a while, this kind of feels like a sort of 19 years later diploma session update. So I feel like I want to sort of just sort of share some of the stuff that I've been uh, involved with since then, which is based around that question of how do we scale this stuff up. And one of the things I'm working on at the moment is a, is a project called 21 Transition Stories for COP21, where we put an invitation out to transition groups uh, in 50 countries now around the world who are doing this and asked for their stories that we could take to Paris in, 20, uh, in, in December to share there and to say, look, actually, this is about a lot more than just carbon. These are communities who are cutting carbon, but they're doing so much more other stuff uh, as well at the same time. There's stories from 15 countries around the world, and I just want to share some of those with you and maybe draw out some of the learnings that might inform this morning's kind of panel. So this is, this is the first uh, one of those stories. This is uh, Black Isle in, in Scotland, Transition Black Isle, and this is their Million Miles project where they set out to reduce the amount of car travel uh, on the peninsula, the Black Isle Peninsula, by a million miles, which is driving to the moon and back twice. In the end, they cut it by 1,300,000 miles. They uh, led to 131,000 more miles being cycled, saved 718 tonnes of carbon, and led to 74,000 more miles being walked. You know, this is... I had a great time and got to meet more people and, and built resilience by building those communities, reweaving people back together again. 
This is, uh, this is uh, about community energy, which Cathy was talking about. One of the things that's been most exciting in transition has been the, this kind of, uh, and in 5,000 communities, not all of them by any stretch of the imagination, transition, uh, but community energy has been a phenomenal way into so much more. This is Brixton Energy that came out of Transition Brixton. Uh, we put together seven different community energy companies that had come through transition, uh, and totaled up, they'd bought in about £13 million of investment from local people. Generated enough electricity for about 36,000 homes, saved about 9,000 tonnes of carbon. But actually the key thing with those projects is that, is that community energy is just a key to unlock so much more. It's not now in this country where the government is considering slashing the tariffs that base, so to basically make community energy completely unviable, it's a total own goal because it's not just about the energy you generate. Community energy generates community, generates investment, generates social events, generates a massive amount, but generates public health, and we lose that really at our peril. Another thing is for me, when I was teaching permaculture design, we kind of designed all the benefits up to the boundaries of the site and not beyond that. And actually, it feels to me like linking everything up is one of the things that we see happening in transition. This is in, in Luxembourg, and uh, Marco is here, I think, from, from Terra, which is a fantastic community-supported agriculture project in, in Luxembourg. But it's part of a, a, of a suite of other cooperatives that are being rolled out. There's an energy co-op, there's a local food co-op. All of these things kind of tie together in a way that, that is really, really important, I think. Doing the unexpected... This is uh, the rise of community currencies, these transition currencies. There's now a million pounds worth of transition currencies in circulation. This is the Brixton Pound, who just produced this limited edition £5 note to celebrate their fifth birthday, designed by a Turner Prize winning artist. Imagine if all of our money looked like that. <laughs> what a different world we would live in. The Brixton Pound described them as wonderful invites for us all to step into a better future. In the city of Bristol now, the mayor of Bristol takes his full salary in Bristol pounds. You can pay your tax with them. You can spend them on the city buses. You can spend them to buy train tickets. You can use them to uh, uh, do something else that I've forgotten about. Uh, all sorts of other stuff. It's just fantastic. It's out there. These ideas are really kind of going. Um, Minimising barriers to participation. A guy called Luigi Russell recently wrote a book uh, called Everything Gardens. And one of the things that he identified as something that Transition does, and again, picking up on your last points there, is about very intentionally trying to minimise the barriers to people picking them up. So this is in, in, in Pasadena, uh, where they started a repair cafe. Very simple idea. And uh, one of the lovely quotes from that was somebody who said, I can't believe that the guy who built the Mars landing rover just fixed my shaver. <laughs> which I really love, because the people from Caltech, who are just up the road, all love on their weekends to come along and fix stuff. And they have a, the way it works is, if you bring something to be fixed, it doesn't cost anything, but while I'm fixing it, sit in a chair and tell me a story. This is in Fishguard, Brogorn in, uh, in Wales. Uh, again, so about real needs. You know, one of the things when we do permaculture design is about, well, what are the needs? Actually, what we see in a lot of permaculture projects is a really interesting kind of going to looking into those needs in a different way. Do people need borage? I'm not sure. I've planted borage in lots of permaculture gardens. I don't eat a great deal of borage, I have to say. <laughs> this is in uh, this is in, uh, in in Fishguard, and what they're doing there is uh, they collect up all the food waste uh, in the town, food that, food waste that would otherwise be thrown away, and they run a cafe based on that food waste. They keep 600 kilos of food a year out of landfill and save 21 tonnes of carbon a year. But again, they're building community, they're bringing together people together, they're creating conversations, they're creating all kinds of other spin-offs and dealing with, with, with food poverty as well. And putting care at the centre. It's one of the things that, 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 that actually, what is this stuff really about? You know, we started out talking about transition as being a response to peak oil, a response to climate change. Actually, we don't talk about it as being a response anymore. We talk about it as being a movement of communities around the world, reimagining and rebuilding their place. Because we don't need to do that response stuff anymore, because all of this stuff is so fantastic. 
You don't need to start out all the time by saying, we do this in response to this. We do it because it's fantastic. And because actually as human beings, as communities, as people, this meets our needs so much better than what's currently being, be, being put forward as the solutions. We don't need the response bit anymore. So this is, a, this is a project in a town where I live called Caring Town Totnes, which is uh, a really interesting look at sort of evolution of transition, of kind of stepping back and saying, well, do we need to be uh, sort of br putting our name all over everything, taking more of a facilitating role? There are 60 different organisations in our town who provide care. <clears throat> and through the austerity cuts, we're seeing a really, really struggling. Caring Town Totnes is about bringing them all together, saying how can we do this in a different way as a centre of, of, of the local economy. So looking at local economy through the lens of care is a really fantastic next step, I think. And cultivating entrepreneurship. You know, one of the things when, when people look around, you know, permaculture uh, transition, say, well, you know, often it's white, middle class people. Well, actually, a lot of the time, when I went to America a couple of years ago, talking with Daria Robinson in, in Richmond, in California, she said, I, I said, it feels to me like, actually, until we're able to create livelihoods for people, that's really how it's going to be. You know, the, the idea that we can just, everybody is able to give time as volunteers. Actually, there's a kind of tyranny of volunteerism, because volunteerism tends to just attract the people who have the time uh, and energy to do it. Actually... Uh, if we can start to be creating livelihoods for people, then it starts to really change. She said, that's so brilliant to hear somebody say that. She said, actually, in my community, if this is a revolution that depends on volunteers, I can't be part of this revolution, nor can anyone uh, where I live. So putting central the idea that people need to be creating livelihoods out of this is really central. This is uh, in Brixton. Uh, the first event called a Local Entrepreneur Forum to run outside of Totnes. It's a fantastic event where you bring the community together, four or five people with ideas for businesses, present their idea to the community and, uh, and invite the community's support. And we say everybody is an investor. Whether you can lend someone a pen, £10,000, let them put stuff in your shed, you're investing in the economy of that place. And it's fantastic. I've never been to an event about business, if you like, that moves people to tears. This is, again, a replicable thing. This can happen anywhere. And one of the things that I think is designed into to, to transition from the beginning has been the idea about going deeper. Actually, this isn't just an outer process. This is an inner process, too. People come on transition training and imagine they're going to get two days of how to start a community energy company how to start local currencies. Actually, what they get is two days of how to keep a group together, how to, how, how, how to have a healthy culture in that. And this is a story uh, from Portugal, from a place called Linda A. Velha, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that properly, which is a transition group. It's a really fantastic story about how they came together, they were doing stuff, then they all started to fall out with each other. And the group kind of fell apart, and then there was a conscious decision to try and rebuild it again and learn from the mistakes that had happened there, to put that idea of going deeper. And Sophie Banks, who's a colleague of mine at Transition Network, some of you may know, says actually when you look at movements around the world that actually are able to live and, and, and survive over time, it's not just about going broader and broader, it's also about going deeper. And actually designing that deepening in from the beginning feels really, really important. Working in partnership, this is in, uh, in, in, in Holland, uh, in a place called Deventer, where a transition uh, group there came together with a local eco-village project and they worked together to build the first eco-village there. Five million euro development, 23 houses, straw bale, earth ships, uh, all that kind of thing. And stories, you know, lots of people have been talking about stories here. I think the stories are so powerful. Uh, this is one of my favourite is, you know, every movement needs its flags, its banners. This is the, the Brixton pound, ten pound note with David Bowie on it. Which actually, I've held this up in talks and it's got a round of applause without me even saying anything. <laughs> and, I, and I went to Paris a few months ago to a transition group there in the suburbs of Paris. And th this gentleman is the mayor and he came out, there was like 120 uh, transitioners there, great event going on there. It was in this beautiful community garden they'd made. He came along, he didn't want to, he wanted to have his photo taken, not with me, not with the transition people holding the £10 note. <laughs> I thought, isn't that interesting? What is it about that that he wanted to be able to take back into his world and say, look, what story does that tell? 
You know, we need those things that, 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 that really tell those stories. What are the sticky stories? So when we're doing transition, when we're doing permaculture, I always really invite people to think, what's the story you can tell here? The town that prints its own money. We did a project in Totnes called Totnes, the nut tree capital of Britain. You know, there's a real story, and they're not Totnes, the nut capital of Britain, which I think was long been assumed to be the case. <laughs> Reskilling, you know, getting people together to, to, to learn the skills. This is in, in Brazil, where uh, two neighborhoods, uh, Brasilândia, which is a, a favela in Sao Paulo, and Gran, Gran, uh, Gran, Gran, I can't say, I shouldn't say it because I haven't got my notes, Granja Viana, which is a more middle class uh, suburb of the city, came together to look at rainwater harvesting. The city is going through an atrocious drought, suffering what some people call a hydric collapse. And people in, in Brasilândia were building their own rainwater harvesting systems, not doing it properly. Mosquitoes were getting in, dengue fever, all sorts of things going on. So they've come together to teach each other how to do rainwater harvesting properly. Transition Streets has been a way of getting people together on a street-by-street -street basis, working together in order to, to, to save water and so on. In the Totnes one, 550 households did it. On average, they cut their carbon by one and a half tonnes. But the key thing they reported as a benefit was knowing their neighbours, feeling part of the community, the place where they live. Looking at the past, the present and the future, this is in South Africa, uh, in Greaton, a fantastic transition group there, who were working with the legacy of apartheid, dealing with the current issues around, around hopelessness and skills in the context of the future around climate change. Work. Often work is something where we don't get to bring all of ourselves to work. Work only wants one bit of us. Actually, how do we build work that really uh, that we can do? Bring all of us to. This is ooh, excuse me. This is Crystal Palace uh, Food Market, a fantastic project there, where they've created a new market that all sorts of people have been able to create new livelihoods because they've created the space and invited people to do that. So, 13 new businesses have now formed because they've created the space and the invitation for people to do that. Uh, and for me, in terms of stepping this stuff up at a community scale, one of the key things is bringing assets into community ownership. As, as communities, when we own assets, we are so much more in control of our destiny than we were before. This is Green Slate Farm near Wigan in a place called Billinge and, and Oral. And uh, they've been doing phenomenal stuff there, bringing this farm into community ownership as a care farm, providing care, uh, all sorts of different stuff that's kicking off from that. And bringing investment in, in different ways. How do, we, how do we then resource this? This is in Liège, in Belgium. They have this amazing project there, the transition group did there, called Centure d'Alimentaire, which means like a food belt around the city, reconnecting the city uh, to the land around it, and looking at that as being a way of generating massive amounts of work and employment and enterprise. The first farms are already going in place, and they're inviting the community to get behind that uh, and invest in it and enable it to happen. And scaling this stuff up is, is the key challenge. And, and in, uh, in, in Peterborough, in, uh, in Canada, they're really looking at that in terms of this sort of 25% uh, shift around food, identifying the economic benefits that that would generate. You know, we move beyond the idea of permaculture being some kind of a fringe thing to actually saying this stuff is a form of economic development. This stuff, if we get it right, is what will create the jobs, what will create the new economies, and it's already happening. We can look out and we can see this stuff happening all over the place. If we can, you know, there is an economic case to be argued there that this meets our needs way, way better. And also, I don't want to give, leave you with the impression, actually, that the bigger, the bigger things are, the more important they are. For me, one of the key things is that all the scales are as important. This is a lovely story in Brussels where a community in a red light district where uh, people were curb crawling up and down this street. People were coming out in the morning to take their kids to school and finding condoms in their doorways. Uh, the council uh, had this idea that they could block the street off in the middle so that people couldn't drive down the streets. Actually, the, the, the transition group said, well, why don't we make a garden instead? So they came and they built this garden out of waste timber. Every uh, 13 different residents have a patch. They say it's fantastic. The kids now play in the street. The place has sort of come back to life again. We have something to talk about each other again. This stuff works on all different scales. So transition is one of the things that I'm presenting here in my uh, diploma update. The other one I just want to mention very briefly, because I know we're running over time, is, uh, is something I'm involved with without my transition hat on in my town in, in Totnes, which is called Atmos. And it's the idea of community becoming its own developer. 
And on an eight acre in old milk factory that used to employ 165 people in the town, they used to make a ton of clotted cream every day. That's a lot of clotted cream. I think the cardiac units of the Southwest are still <laughs> getting their heads around that one. Uh, uh, we've run a process uh, to, to, for community-led development using a new government power here where you can, uh, if you've engaged lots of people, you can run a referendum as a route to planning. If more than 50% of people who vote vote in favour, that's full planning permission. And we're doing this as a, uh, as a community-led thing. This is the day that we were able to make the announcement to the community that we'd signed an agreement with, with the site's owners. Uh, this, is the, this is the design as it's coming along, 70 uh, affordable, 100% affordable houses built using local materials, built using skills and training, new public space, uh, edible landscaping. Uh, we've consulted 3,500 people so far in a town of 8,500, it'll be over 5,000 by the time we get to the referendum. There's something here. But in terms of informing this question, you know, having sort of come through permaculture, for me, one of the things is, one of the key things about, about scaling up is we have to be able to step way, way out of our comfort zones. All too often, we, get, we, we stay in our comfort zones because they're comfortable. <laughs> Funny that. So, but actually, stepping outside of them is really scary. This is a really scary project to be part of. I'm one of five directors who are, who are, who are behind this scheme. You know, every day we're stepping out into the unknown. It's you, you kind of living with feeling deeply unnerved is just kind of part of the territory. But actually, that's where the, that's where the fruit is, going out on the limb. That's where the fruit is. And sometimes we fall out of the tree, and sometimes we end up in the grass looking down. Amazing what you can learn looking into the grass after you've fallen out of the tree. <laughs> but stepping out of our comfort zones is really central to this. So I just wanted to leave you with, with a thought, really, about scaling up. Uh, and when I was uh, a, a very good friend of mine in Los Angeles, uh, which is a city, as somebody said yesterday in the workshop, suffering the most atrocious water crisis, who's been looking at that, a guy called Andy Lipkiss, who some of you might know, from an organization called Tree People, uh, who are doing incredible work, trying to think of LA as being like a forest. And I talked to him about scaling up, and I'll just leave you with these, uh, with these words that he said. He said, our job is to make viable the alternative and have it ready. If we've really done our homework, we could scale this thing in a flash. Thank you very much.